Good afternoon. We're approaching the weekend and we are in Luke and Acts in 70 days. Uh, we're doing chapters 15 through um, 21. <clears throat> and despite what that says on your paper, <laughs> um, we are talking about Luke and Acts in Luke. We, Luke was recording about the events in the life of Jesus. And then in Acts, it's his second volume. <clears throat> and technically speaking, he's speaking about the life of Jesus as it is revealed through the early church. To Luke, it's all one story. Um, some of the main issues that we will see in Luke's writings are that the gospel is for all people, that we will see evidence of the Holy Spirit at work, we will look at the nature and the mission of the church, and in this one, um, as well as a few of the other previous chapters, we see how much persecution suffering and sacrifice was involved um, in the formation of the early church. Uh, our joys and concerns today, uh, I would like to in particular lift up um, Bill Porter. Bill told us last Sunday that he had been diagnosed with a leaky heart valve that was going to require a new heart valve, uh, a procedure to put in a new heart valve, and uh, we need to keep Bill in our prayers, not only for his uh, safety through the surgery, but also through his recovery and granting him peace and comfort in, in this time of trial. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we run to you as a child runs to their parent when they are afraid, when they've skinned their knee, when they need help. We run to you. You are our steadfast rock. You are where our hope is, and that is a confident hope in your goodness, in your power, and in your presence. We thank you for the opportunities that you give us, opportunities that were not present for those in the early church. Um, we thank you that we have the totality of scripture provided for us, that we have backgrounds of study and, and uh, tradition that inform us. We thank you that you have provided us with a knowledge <clears throat> of you and your nature um, that, that cannot possibly reveal it all, but that is enough for us to lean into you with confidence. We ask today that as we experience the gift of your word, that you open our hearts and open our minds, that we would be prepared and eager for the transformation that lies ahead. You're transforming us into your likeness, you transforming us according to your will and to your way. And we submit ourselves wholeheartedly to this process, Father, for we choose, we desire to look like you, to sound like you, to be like you in all of our interactions in our interactions with family, 
with friends, with neighbors, with friends within the church and faith family, but even farther extended to strangers and even farther still to enemies. We desire to be your image in the world. Existence on earth can be full of joy and beauty, wonderful experiences, and it can be full also of suffering and pain and challenges and hardship. And through it all, we seek to be close to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Thank you. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to be talking about the early church and uh, how Jesus um, is the foundation of the early church. Jesus is our foundation. So we're going to, uh, these lyrics may not look familiar to you, but it's to the tune of Come Thou Almighty King, which I know you're familiar with. And the lyrics, these lyrics are particularly um, appropriate for our study today. Christ for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring, with loving zeal, the poor and them that mourn, the faint and overborn, sin sick and sorrow worn, whom Christ of heal. Christ for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring. With fervent prayer, the wayward and the lost, by restless passions tossed, redeemed at countless cost from dark despair. And we'll let share in our opening. <clears throat> we commit ourselves individually and as a community to the way of Christ, to take up the cross, to seek abundant life for all humanity, to struggle for peace with justice and freedom, to risk ourselves in faith, hope, and love, praying that God's kingdom may come. Um, this section of scripture that we're going to look at today uh, is entitled Christ's Love Made Visible Through the Church. Um, some of the previous passages have dealt a lot with the struggles that Paul and Barnabas um, and other followers of Christ had to deal with in the outside world. But today um, we're going to see more than ever about conflict within the church and how uh, how those transpired, what developed them, and uh, how they were dealt with. So in Acts 15, 1 through 3, uh, oh, and by the way, you have a map at the back of your packet, and you may just want to keep it to the side. It won't be convenient being attached because you're going to there's going to be so many references to it. But um, Paul and Barnabas are in Antioch at this point, which is in Syria to the far east of your map on the uh, far right-hand side. Syria is the green area, and Antioch is the one where, where there's a uh, up toward the north of that green area that has a lot of arrows around it. Uh, that's because it's a, a bit of a hub for the Gentile mission. Um, to the south of Antioch, we have Judea, and that's where Jerusalem is located. So the scripture begins, certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, 
Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed by the church in Antioch, the, uh, the Christian church. Along, They were appointed along with some other believers to go back to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question of circumcision and salvation. Now we know that when Stephen was stoned to death, the disciples, the followers of Christ, had scattered. And um, so we have some here at the church in Antioch. But the apostles stayed primarily in the Jerusalem area to run the Jewish Christian mother church there in Jerusalem. And so that was where um, all their decisions that govern doctrine in the church, theology, behaviors, etc., um, had to go through the church in Jerusalem. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed to go to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, going south, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. And this news made all the believers very glad. So all the way, all along the way, they're talking about their, the Gentile conversions. <clears throat> the first verse says, certain people came down from Judea, and these were Jewish Christians, often called Judaizers, um, that believed if gentle uh, if Gentile converts were to share in God's promises, they had to be circumcised. For them, not being circumcised served to exclude them from the covenant community. So Paul and Barnabas and other church leaders made their way to Jerusalem to argue the case for grace. The Judaizers also expected that the Gentile converts obey all the laws of Moses. And we know that at the time of Christ, there were over 600 laws and, and rules that were extraneous, so to speak, but, but integral to the faith uh, as practiced by those in the Jewish religion. That was a heavy burden for Gentiles coming in, um, particularly when it seemed to ignore the concept that we uh, know to be true today, that we are saved by grace. All of us are saved by grace, not by our behaviors, not by the law, um, and not by rules. Um, so they get to um, Jerusalem and they make their case before um, the Jewish council there, the Jewish Christian council there, which, by the way, is headed by James, who this James is the brother of Jesus, they believe. I think that's interesting because as far as I know, there was not much record of the brother of Jesus named James being a real active part in the ministry of Christ when he was on earth. But here we have him as head of the Jewish Christian church in Jerusalem. And um, he, was the, he, he and his council were the ones that listened to uh, disputes of theology and doctrine and uh, were the deciders, so to speak of how uh, the, the Christian church would, um, would go on certain issues. So he listened to Paul's making of the case and Silas also and the other believers. He listened and he ruled. Um, one of the things that Paul emphasized was the Holy Spirit uh, that was obviously being uh, poured out on the Gentile believers at the point of their conversion. 
And so James ruled, and the ruling was that the Gentiles do not have to be troubled with loads of laws and rituals, but they do have to hold to some of the Jewish basics. We're going to let them off the hook for for the big for some of the big things like circumcision, but we are going to expect them to keep number one, not eating meat offered to idols. Uh, when meat was offered to idols, sometimes it was recycled, so to speak, and sold uh, in the marketplace. But Jewish folk were not supposed to eat those, and they even are saying this about the Jewish Christians that they also are not to eat meat that has been offered to idols. They're not to eat the blood of an animal and not eat uh, strangled animals because that would uh, mean that the animals probably still had blood that had not been drained from its body. And they were not to be sexually immoral. Well, this ruling relaxed a lot for the new Gentile converts and for those ministering to them. And so there was a great deal of celebration over this compromise. Um, now Paul wants to make a new journey. And if you look on your map, the first journey that he had taken with uh, Barnabas is in, marked in blue. And you can see, uh, we, we talked about that first trip uh, last week week in our lesson. But now he's wanting to uh, make a new journey over that old territory to see how the churches are getting along. And Paul, Luke is wanting us to realize that Paul is doing more than just planting churches. Plant a church, move on. Plant a church, move on. That Paul <coughs> recognizes that part of his call is not only to plant the church or start the church, but to maintain it, to grow it, to strengthen it, to develop it, to mentor to it, to teach, and to continue to teach it. And he's always concerned about nurturing and growing uh, these churches along the way. One evidence we have of this is not only his return mission trips to these places, but also the letters he wrote to the churches uh, that he established. And what a great resource for the early church to receive letters from Paul that were so explicit about practices and doctrines and so directed toward the individual church and what their um, issues were. It gave them a lot of room to grow. And I was, as I thought about it, what a, what a benefit and what a gift it was when they could say, well, we're not agreeing about this. Let's go back and look at Paul's letters again. Let's, let's read this again and see how, uh, what he has to say about it. So it was something that they could refer to again and again. And it could also be rewritten and shared with other neighboring churches. Um, in... Acts 15, 36 through 41, it continues that sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark, and on your map you will see it says they sailed from Cyprus. And um, but while um, Paul chose Silas and left, and commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord, he went from through Syria and and Cilicia. So. Barnabas and Mark went south, and Paul and Silas went north, um, strengthening the churches. What we hear in this is several things. This is a conflict between Paul and Barnabas. Some of it comes out of a different personality uh, 
base. It certainly doesn't come out. This conflict doesn't come out of a lack of belief in the Lord. This is an issue that has to do with their personal approach to relationships. And we know that Barnabas's name meant encourager. So he's not saying that Mark, he doesn't even try to defend him, that Mark didn't maybe make an error in leaving their earlier mission trip to go back home. Um, he's just saying, I think he's worth investing in. I think he's worth mentoring. I think he will have value to the ministry as we go on if we take some time to help him develop. And so Paul, uh, Barnabas takes this, this attitude of encouragement as a way of growing Mark. Paul, on the other hand, has a little bit of a different nature. Paul is very demanding of himself. And I, I'm pretty sure you probably know people like that. I've been that person before. When you demand a lot of yourself, it pretty much follows that you're going to demand a lot from the people around you and expect a lot from the people around you and uh, perhaps be a little intolerant of their uh, failures. It doesn't make Paul a bad person. It's a, just a difference in how he sees things. He believes, set an expectation. If you don't live up to it, then I'm not going to trust you again for a while anyway. Um, we do know that later on in his ministry, Paul asked for John Mark and has a different, and at that point in time, holds a different attitude about him. Um, there is room in the church for people of all kinds and of all temperaments. True Christian faith is a living relationship with God through Jesus Christ and a desire to do God's will in and through the church. Christians can and will struggle with differing ideas of what it means to be a Christian, with differing methods of doing the work, and even sometimes personality clashes. What is required of us is faith in Christ and a submitting to Him in obedience. Um, and the thing that is reassuring, uh, I find this passage very reassuring um, when considering the possibilities in the discernment process because one of the things that happens here is, first of all, it shows that two folks who love the Lord and are devoted to the gospel can have different opinions. But second, it shows that even disagreements and arguments within the church can be turned to the Holy Spirit's will. For now, for them, Instead of one mission with Paul and Barnabas, now there are two missions to the Gentiles instead of one. So what looks on the surface to be an uncomfortable and maybe even a, 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 to be avoided a conflict, God is so good and God is so powerful that he can use even disagreements and arguments and use it to foster greater development of his kingdom. I love that reassurance. In Acts, as we have seen it already and continue to look at it, there are four major thrusts of missionary work into the Gentile world. <clears throat> The first was in chapter 10 last week, Peter's encounter with Cornelius. That was the great uh, conversion of a Gentile household 
uh, a Gentile Pentecost, so to speak. And then also last week, we looked at chapter 11, which was that first missionary trip <coughs> that went um, into Cyprus and into Cyrene. And then, then we also had that Paul and Barnabas's full missionary, that first missionary trip that's marked in blue that shows their uh, first missionary trip. But now we're in chapter 16 through 20, and it's going to be talking not about Paul and Barnabas, but about Paul and Silas. And the truth of the matter is, we don't hear anything else about Barnabas, I don't believe. Uh, the difference being that Paul was a writer and Luke was accompanying Paul on much of his uh, missionary work, and Luke was a writer. So we have writers that are recording things for, for future reference or for further reference, where it seems that Barnabas most likely did not have someone who fulfilled that function that was traveling with him. It doesn't mean that his missions were not important and that they didn't accomplish a lot. They just were not recorded events. Um, Chapter 16, we find uh, several interesting events happening. One is the they meet Lydia. And I think most of us, when we hear the name Lydia, we think of purple cloth. She was a dealer in purple cloth, which was a rarity in that time. Um, more than likely, they assume that she was wealthy because the only ones who could afford her product were the wealthy. And um, Lydia and her household are converted and baptized. Uh, in that time, by the way, when they talk about households being converted, that included family and the slaves that are servants that were in the service of that family. Those were part of the household. We've heard of another household that was converted. Last week's reading with uh, the centurion, Cornelius, his household was converted and baptized. Now Lydia's. Um, and then as the, as the scripture unfolds, there is a, a transaction or a series of transactions with a, I believe the scripture calls her a deranged slave girl. She is assumed to be uh, possessed by demons, and the demon enables her to tell fortunes. The owners, her owners, make an income off of her fortune telling. Well, this um, girl in her imbalance gets very obsessed with Paul and the work that he and Silas are doing. And she seems to be always hanging around and, and interrupting and, and making comments. And finally, Paul has just about had enough. And in the name of Jesus, he cast the demons, the demon out of her, which was wonderful for the girl, but not so good for the people that owned her because her value wasn't in anything of her own. Her value was in the fact that she was inhabited by a demon who could tell fortunes. They end up um, filing charges against Paul. And uh, they sort of twist the facts around a bit to say he's disrupting uh, the community. He's disrupting things around here. And... Um, Really, what he was disrupting was their their income stream. Um, but Paul and Silas were arrested. In that process, they were stripped and brutally flogged and thrown into prison. And that's where I'll pick up the scripture reading. About midnight, remember, they've been stripped and flogged and thrown into prison. 
About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. That's a powerful thing right there, that not only were they singing and praying in their suffering and in their persecution, in the midst of their persecution, but others were hearing it. And I would like to take just a minute aside to say that frequently the question arises within the people of faith and without on the outside, the people that are not faithful, lift up the question, why would a loving, all-powerful, all-loving, all-good God allow suffering among his people? And this is one answer. This is not the only answer, but this is one answer. Because when we are in a time of suffering, and we respond with confidence in Him, others notice. It draws attention. People don't notice you so much if you're, if you have a great, if you have a great uh, job and you have a beautiful home and you have some spick and span, shiny, precious children and you, everything is going well and you're wealthy. People don't notice that you're happy so much. But if you exude the spirit of joy and peace that comes from a relationship with God, even when you are, when you've been diagnosed with cancer, even when um, relationships break apart, even when there's grief in your life, you still exude a hope and a confidence in God, people notice that. That is one of the primary functions of suffering in humanity among believers is so that it can point the way to the Lord. Anyway, suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. This is some earthquake. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. That's a pretty specific earthquake. And the jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. Do you remember when Peter escaped? What happened to his jailer? He he was executed. And it was known by jailers that if they allowed their prisoners to escape, it would cost them their lives. So he's ready to kill himself. But Paul shouts, don't harm yourself. We're all here. Peter's escape had led to the execution of the jailer, but not this time. The heart of this story is the conversion of the jailer. The jailer had heard, to start with, he had heard Paul and Silas praying and singing hymns to God in spite of their beatings and imprisonment. And I am sure that that had piqued their, his interest in them. And now, Paul and Silas, by the very way in which they endured the hardship and personal insult, gave glory to God and witness to others that Christ is worth everything they have to bear. And the the jailer says, what must I do to be saved? He's begging for their kind of freedom, a kind of freedom that they experience even when they're still in jail. They experience this spiritual freedom He wants that kind of freedom. And they say to him, trust in the Lord. He is to believe in Christ. And he does. He and his whole family, here we have it again. He and his whole family were baptized and he was filled with joy. Um, 
so we've had the centurion household we've had lydia's household now we have the jailer's household and one of the sweetest things here is that immediately after his conversion he is tending to the wounds of paul and silas paul and silas were wounded while he and he was sleeping on it he could have cared less but just a few short events changed his whole perspective. And now, because of his conversion, there is an empathy and a compassion in him that causes him to tend to his prisoners. Um, so then we move on to chapter 17. And in 17, Paul and Silas are preaching in Thessalonica and Berea. Now on your map, that's the yellow area and uh, that's part of Macedonia. And you will find Berea and Thessalonica there with a lot of arrows and colors going through them. Um, and uh, as always... What is Paul's first stop in every town? The synagogue. Paul is a Jew. He is a Jewish Christian, but he is still a Jew. And he always goes to the synagogue first. And when he's there teaching the Jews, he does two things. First of all, he tells the story of his conversion his personal experience with the resurrected Christ, this supernatural event that led to his conversion. And second, he uses Old Testament scripture and shows how Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament scripture. So while he's there in Thessalonica, he's teaching um, the way things work on the Sabbath they the the men would gather at the synagogue for their teaching and if there was uh outsiders there guests from out of town after their brief scripture reading or message that someone was deliver and message that someone was delivering they would open the floor to the guest and say would you like to say something and so paul spoke at that time and the Thessalonians were so interested that they begged him to come back on their next Sabbath. And so Paul ended up preaching or teaching in the uh, Thessal Thessalonian synagogue three weeks, three different Sabbath uh, gatherings. And about that time, the dissension within the synagogue would reach a point where um, things would get rough because there were still those who accepted and those who denied, those who believed and those who refused to believe. And a tension would cr be created um, over time between those two groups. And eventually they had to sneak Paul out under cover of darkness to get him out of town. Uh, and that's when he went to Berea. I, I really like this uh, aspect of the scripture, Acts 17, 11. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. I think this is appropriate uh, for all. We, we have to remember that, that it is important for us um, to listen when others are teaching and preaching, but we also have, it is necessary for us individually to go into scripture ourselves to verify what is being said. And if it 
does seem to us to um, go with Scripture. Now, what happens with the Berean Jews is that they were more open-minded and more willing to study Scripture every day to see if what Paul was saying was true. He's a famous apostle. Well, some he's a famous teacher, missionary of the church. Uh, some do not include him with the apostle designation, but but yet the Bereans, in their listening, then they would study for themselves, and I think that is something for us here at Christ Church. We need to take that responsibility upon ourselves. This is a time of discernment that we've entered into, which does not mean that that information will just be dumped on us and uh, we will be told what to do. It means we will be given resources of information that it is important for us to study and it is important for us to look into Scripture ourselves and for us to pray ourselves personally about this. Um, I believe that is the responsibility of each one of us in this church family. And I would encourage you to, to take up the nature of the Berean Jews in this, um, in this respect. Um, and then... They were on to Athens, and that is, of course, in Greece. And uh, we have Acts 17, 19 through 21. Uh, when he was in Athens, then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus. And that was a council that had jurisdiction over religion and morals. And they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting? This gospel is what they wanted to know. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians <coughs> and the foreigners who had lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking, but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. That was their pastime. That was their hobby. All they wanted to do was hear the latest fashion of philosophy, the latest fad in, in thinking about things. But it never was applied in their lives. What a hollow way to approach faith, that all it is is just being curious and interested about all the new ideas, but never changing your heart or allowing your heart to be changed. Paul, when he's preaching to them, uses what they know. Uh, he says, well, I was looking at your gods and I saw one that said the unknown God. And I would say to you, I know who that God is. He's the one and only true God of the Jewish people. And so he linked up something that they were familiar with with something he knew he was trying to teach them. And also he said, he used the phrase, we are all his offspring, which was um, a part of a poem that they were familiar with by a Greek poet. And he's using that as a way to understand that God is the creator of all. He is the father of us all. Then Paul continues to Corinth, which is further inland. Uh, there on the map, it's still part of Greece. And it's a port city. And you may say, well, it looks like it's right in the middle of the landmass. But if you look, there are two bodies of water that cut into the land, one from the east and one from the west. And Corinth is right there where those bodies of those inlets come in. Um, and it's a great seaport city in Greece. And unfortunately, it was known for its wickedness. And while Paul was there, he met Priscilla and Aquila. And, um, and he, he also was reunited with Silas and Timothy. 
They worked in Corinth for about 18 months. That's a long time, considering that, oh, he was back in Thessalonica for three weeks um, at the synagogue there. But while he was um, teaching in the Corinthian synagogue, it was just like every other experience. There were those who rejected the gospel, and there were those who accepted the gospel. One of the stranger things was, though, that the leader of the synagogue, Crispus, and his household believed. And so here's another household that is converted within the Jewish um, Christian church. And on top of that, uh, Titius Justus, who was a Gentile God-fearer, was also uh, converted to the Christian faith. Belief leads to baptism, leads to the formation of a new Christian community. Um, then we have a story, I mean, just the mention of this. Um, on his way back to Antioch, Paul had his hair cut off at Chinchoria because of a vow he had taken. Nothing else is said about that. Part of that is because the folks reading this that were of um, Jewish heritage would have understood all about the vow. That would have been something they were very familiar with. Um, later on in chapter 21, there is more um, detail about this. When he gets to Jerusalem, the uh, Jerusalem council there tells him that there are four men there who uh, need to go through the shaving of their heads because they have just finished their vow. And they tell Paul to join with them in their purification. So it sort of worked like this. A vow was something that was a temporary devotion to, um, to certain principles. And when you finished your temporary period of your vow, then you would shave your head as a sign that you had completed your vow. Now, most scholars believe that this was probably a Nazarite vow, and there were four uh, requirements in a Nazarite vow. One was to avoid alcohol and vinegar. Two was to avoid all products of the vine. Three was not cut your hair during the period of the vow. And four was to avoid dead bodies. And when that vow was completed successfully, then as a sign to the community that you had finished your vow, you would shave your head. So that's what we have going on here. Um, do you remember, we did not have a discussion about this, but when Timothy joined Paul in the mission field, Paul had Timothy become circumcised. And that was really strange because Paul didn't believe that circumcision was necessary. The difference being the opponents were wanting to require circumcision for salvation. Paul was preaching the new gospel. Jesus came to say, it's not anything you do to earn it. Salvation comes as a gift of God. It is my gift. It is a gift of grace and mercy. And so for that reason, Paul stood against circumcision. But with Timothy going into the mission field with him, Paul did not want Timothy to experience um, any difficulties because it looked like he wasn't following the laws of God. And so in a way, he, it's, it seems that he was having Timothy become circumcised to appease and make those who held that position more comfortable, not because they believed there was salvation available in it, but because it established a, a connection with them. 
Same thing with the vow. Paul had been told that there were lots of Jews who were saying that he was opposing Jews keeping the laws of God, that he was opposed to the laws of God. And so that this vow that he took, which included at the end shaving his head, was meant to show that he was still devoted to the laws of God. It was meant to reassure the Jewish folk that he was not an enemy of the laws of God. Next, he stops off at Ephesus, <coughs> which is across the Aegean Sea uh, from Corinth and Athens. Ephesus is on the coast there of Asia, that province of Asia. And you can see a lot of uh, routes coming in and out of, of Ephesus. Um, but he, he just stopped there briefly before he went on to Caesarea. But uh, Aquila and Priscilla stayed there. And then he went on to Antioch for a stay there. And after spending some time, and it doesn't tell how long, in Antioch, Paul sets out on his third mission trip, uh, revisiting many of the same places. The third mission trip on your map is the purple. <clears throat> and you can see that it goes back to many of the places that he had been before. Um, Ephesus seems to be fertile ground for Paul, and he preaches in a synagogue there for three months. And at that point, um, some division arises between the converts and the deniers. So here, Paul doesn't leave town, which has been his practice. His practice has been when things start getting really antsy between the converts and the deniers, he will leave town. But this time he doesn't. He rents a lecture hall and preaches every day for two years outside the synagogue. Acts 19 verses 10 and then verse 20 say this, this went on for two years so that all the Jews and, Gen and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. All of them heard the word of the Lord. And verse 20 says, In this way, the word of the Lord spread wild, widely and grew in power. Uh, Paul eventually heads back to Jerusalem where his enemies cause a near riot and it leads to his arrest. And we will talk about his arrest and trials and incarcerations and his uh, trip to Rome uh, will be part of your readings for next week in chapters 22 through 28. The truth is, all along his missionary journeys, Paul's ministry is often interrupted by opposing agitators. But even threats to his safety do not prevent him from sharing the gospel. It does not prevent God from growing his kingdom. It con continues to grow in number and in strength. Let's read our closing together. We rejoice in every sign of God's kingdom, in the upholding of human dignity and community, in every expression of love, justice, and reconciliation in each act of self-giving on the behalf of others, in the abundance of God's gifts entrusted to us, that all may have enough, enough for their, to be filled from their hunger, enough to have their thirst satisfied, have enough to have a roof over their head, have enough of the Holy Spirit to keep them filled. Amen.